Hello again, everyone. It's been ages. Great to see you. Thank you for coming across from the other broadcast. And if you're watching later on, welcome to the first in the new series of Deep Dives. Uh, as you can see, I've already got a fantastic audience here uh, live. But if you're watching later on, well, uh, these particular broadcasts, I think, lend themselves very much to watching as and when you like. Uh, they are free lectures, really, into all aspects of music. Uh, as as uh, somebody said to me on Twitter, are you missing teaching? I think the answer has to be, well, I don't think I ever really stopped. Um, so for those of you who are new to the deep dives, very, very welcome. My name is Ben. Uh, I am a music teacher. I've been a music teacher now for 20 plus years. Um, I taught in schools. Uh, I've taught every age it's possible to teach young children from nursery through every every age of primary through secondary to university and adult education. And it is my great pleasure uh, to lead courses like this. And I just see we've got lots of lovely people. Hello to everyone. Um, just checking you can all see and hear me, which I think you can. Um, I see we've got a few people with a few computer problems, but I hope you've all got it sorted. And um, yeah, enjoy everyone. So this is aimed at everybody. Uh, you don't need to have any musical knowledge for this. There's not going to be a test uh, at the end. Sorry for those of you that want to be tested. Uh, <laughs> it's not that kind of lecture. Um, so we're going to be talking today, everyone, about Mozart's Levy Requiem. So let's bring this up on screen. Here we go. I do like my new whooshy button. Uh, and so this is the first, I say, in a series uh, which I'm calling Exploring the Great Works. And notice I'm not saying Exploring the Great Choral Works necessarily. Uh, we will look at a lot of choral pieces, as this channel is called Home Choir. But I didn't want to be restricted to just choral works. I, for example, am desperate to talk to you about some of Schubert's piano music, for example, Beethoven's symphonies, and far more. So over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to basically walk through some of my favourite pieces. Some of them will be uh, familiar choral works. Some of them might be a bit more up to date. We might talk about some jazz, maybe even if I can get the right uh, right music to play some film music. We'll have to see. Um, but today we are talking about the wonderful Requiem in D minor by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And many of you learnt this piece with me in SIC earlier this year. Uh, a very, very memorable course, not just for the music, but also for the hair. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I, I don't want to spoil it. Now look, Mozart's Requiem is a very, very famous piece. It's one of the most famous choral works, if not the most famous choral work, largely because there's such a sense of mystery and intrigue about it. If you've ever seen Amadeus, you know what I'm talking about. It's that work, the piece that he wrote on his deathbed uh, that apparently uh, Salieri commissioned and Salieri was, was, uh, was working him to death and the hooded figure and so on. Now, we're going to go through a lot of that today and hopefully dispel a few of the myths. If you aren't familiar with the work, however, in, in its entirety, can I commend it to you as one of the great life experiences to enjoy it? Uh, and certainly seeing it live at the moment is almost impossible, um, but to listen to it, it's just staggering, staggering music. So let's cr uh, crack on straight away, ladies and gentlemen, with a couple of slides which uh, were, the, these reflect pieces that were produced in the same year as the Requiem. Now we know Mozart wrote the Requiem on his deathbed. He died before it could be completed on the 5th of December 1791 and he was only 35 when he died. Incredibly young. Um, this seems to have been a, a fairly common theme with a number of our greater composers. Schubert was 33, Mendelssohn was also 33, Purcell was, the, you know, this, uh, Purcell was in his early 30s. All of these composers uh, suffered from the same, uh, same problem really which is that they were incredibly talented and they died before they could really get into that sort of that point where they were fully confident uh, and amazing practitioners. That's not to say Mozart wasn't phenomenal, but just imagine if he'd lived another 10 years. Anyway, so 1791 saw the creation of a number of incredibly important works for Mozart. It was also a really fateful year. A lot went wrong in his life. He was a child prodigy, as many, many of you, I'm sure, know. Uh, and he did enjoy, actually, despite the legends of him dying penniless, he did enjoy a fair degree of success during his life. But the last couple of years were extremely tough and almost certainly contributed to his early demise. Um, so in addition to uh, the, the Clemenzo di Tita, which is, di Tito, I should say, which is uh, his opera Syria, that is to say his serious opera, uh, he also wrote 
two other major works. One was the Magic Flute, the Tsarba Flauta, which you'll see a, uh, this is an actual set design from 1791 for the first performance for the Queen of the Night's Aria. Can you just imagine that as a wonderful, wonderful set? And um, so he produced these works and he also wrote this Requiem Mass. And the Requiem is a very, very important, uh, important uh, genre, I suppose, of choral work. And uh, this chap here, this is Michael Haydn, not Joseph Haydn. This is Michael Haydn, the younger brother of Joseph. And Mozart followed the structure for his Requiem that Michael Haydn had laid down. Prior to this, the Requiem, well, it was a, a standard liturgical uh, structure, but it, it wasn't necessarily constructed in a particular way. There are a number of movements that you can include, including an introit, um, a gradual, uh, an offertory, uh, you can have communion in the middle of it, but the structure that Mozart followed had the Kyrie eleison, um, uh, the the uh, Requiem Eternal, I should say, Kyrie eleison, Dies Irae, um, and so on, including a Sanctus and an Agnus Dei and an in, uh, in Paradisum at the end. Now, subsequent composers, thinking about, for example, Foy, did away with a lot of the fire and brimstone and brought in more elements and modern composers bring in all sorts of additional uh, structures and, and additional elements to make the Requiem their own. But Mozart wrote his Requiem following the example of Michael Haydn here. And of course, the origins of the Requiem date back to really the first millennium with the origins of Christianity and the birth of Gregorian chant in the churches. So Mozart was, was supported by a long tradition when he wrote his Requiem. But why did he write it? Well, it's interesting. Mozart knew he wasn't well. He, he suspected he was dying. We'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. But we know he who was aware of his uh, of his illness because he wrote to his father. And he, the letters between Mozart and his father are some of the best documents we have uh, to, to get to know Mozart. And we, we really get to see a side of his personality that, that really shines through in his music and honesty uh, that he, he showed to his father. And throughout his life, Mozart had a complicated relationship with death. He lost his mother very, very young, um, was surrounded by um, poverty and death in, in the cities that he lived in. And he wrote to his father, this is very, very moving, as death is the true goal of our existence, I formed during the last few years such close relationships with this best and truest friend of mankind that death's image is not only no longer terrifying to me, but is indeed very soothing and consoling. And these are Mozart's words, albeit translated into English. And with that in mind, everyone, you, you have to look at the Requiem in, in view of these words. Uh, the piece itself, it does have some fire and brimstone, the Dies Irae, of course, and Confrutatis, the very loud, uh, very dramatic movements. But the vast majority of the music in the Requiem is either mournful or it's beautiful and it's restful and it's soothing and consoling and if you compare it to other composers who have set really fiery uh, and aggressive requiem masses Mozart's is actually very very gentle uh, and and very beautiful for that so it's worth bearing in mind as I say these words he wrote to his father now this this calm towards death can be sort of seen throughout the requiem as I say and um Interestingly, Mozart, as I said, he knew that he wasn't well. He suspected that he was dying. He, he wrote that he believed that he'd been poisoned with something called aqua tofana, which is a very, very slow-acting poison. Uh, and then, you know, I suppose, sensing his end, when he was commissioned to write the Requiem, he effectively wrote it for himself as a kind of final confession. And tofana, I've, I've heard about aqua tofana throughout my life. I've read this particular letter. Um, but I never actually, until researching this particular deep dive, I never thought, well, what's, what is aqua tofana? And uh, it is based on arsenic, and it was a particular favourite uh, 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 preparation of this lady here, Giuliana Tofana, who was a 17th century Italian retailer of bespoke poisons, and she was also a pioneering feminist. So we have a lot of writings about and by uh, Giuliana Tofana. And she sold this lethal inve uh, in invention, aqua tofana, as a way largely to ladies who wished to be rid of their husbands. <laughs> so uh, if you'd like to support the channel, there's a link in the description. You can buy your own one on Amazon Prime. They might have sold out, but uh, there we are. That's aqua tofana. <laughs> it's not really. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit more about where Mozart was in terms of his headspace leading up to the creation of the Requiem. Now, I said things have actually gone quite well for Mozart in his late 20s and early 30s. Um, he was in Vienna. He was very much the favourite of the emperor. This is uh, Emperor Joseph II. And uh, the emperor was a huge fan of the arts. Uh, this is where the, the phrase too many notes, Mr. Mozart, came from. And um, uh, one thing to bear in mind is that at the same time while all this was happening, um, the French Revolution, which of course was 1789, uh, caused huge problems throughout Europe. It wasn't just uh, France where things started to get a, a little bit uneasy because, of course, all the, uh, the, the royal families of Europe were all related to each other. And so Marie Antoinette was a cousin of, uh, of Joseph II. When she was executed, he saw the writing on the wall and he started to make significant social changes, cutting funding for the arts, started to invest in uh, large-scale uh, projects for the people, which was very unpopular, actually, with the landowners, and caused a lot of problems for him. He subsequently died. And this was a problem for Mozart, because the emperor was his greatest ally his greatest patron um, and so not only was his patron uh, uh, out of the picture and the new emperor was no fan of Mozart also uh, the uh, the cuts to the arts and uh, we all know what that's like looking at the current situation uh, effectively crippled Mozart's income and so uh, the fact he was a Freemason as well didn't help um, because the Freemasons were still seen as a sort of shadowy society not trusted um, despite the fact that they were actually quite a well-meaning bunch, particularly in those years. So things were not going well for Mozart in 1789. This is still two years before he died. Um, the other thing that happened is, of course, Mozart uh, relied a huge amount on his friendship with his, his friend and mentor, uh, Joseph Haydn, known to him as Papa Haydn. Uh, and they were great, great friends, despite the huge age gap. I remember Haydn, uh, when he first met Mozart as a child, wept and took uh, took Mozart's father to one side and said, I say, I say to you, your son is the greatest musician, greatest composer I've ever met. Um, and they wrote a lot of music for each other. Uh, they de devoted and dedicated uh, pieces to each other. But Haydn left Vienna and went to London at this point. Interestingly, um, both Mozart and Haydn were invited to go to London by a prestigious theatre director. Haydn took up the offer, Mozart didn't. Mozart opted to stay in Vienna, and again, one wonders if Mozart had taken that risk to move his family over to London, would he have lived longer? Would he have, uh, uh, would he have suffered uh, as he did? We don't know. Um, but really, as we approach 1791, the last year of his life, Mozart is struggling in a way he's never done before. Uh, as one of his biographers wrote, approaching the history of his Requiem already means to enter agony. You know, he was already in a very, very dark place before he thought he was dying. Um, so there we are. Now let's introduce uh, this chap here. Now, if you're familiar with Amadeus, if you, you spot down the world, the great F. Murray Abraham played uh, this phenomenal, phenomenal figure, Salieri. And whenever you mention Salieri, most people go, boo, hiss. But actually, Salieri is not uh, in any way a villain in this story. Um, it, he was a convenient foil for, uh, uh, for the film, for Peter Schaeffer to write, uh, to write in uh, you know, a sort of dark figure. But actually, Salieri is an immensely important figure in Mozart's life and subsequently in Beethoven's and probably most importantly in the life of Schubert. He was a great uh, protector and a great defender of composers and supported them, particularly in, in their young years. He was a, an immensely important figure. Um, but actually, Salieri and Mozart uh, worked very well together. He was not present uh, at Mozart's deathbed, frantically writing down uh, notes, I'm afraid. That was all invented for Amadeus. Having said that, it's a brilliant film. Do enjoy it. But a lot of it is artistic, poetic license. Um, now, the real villain, I suppose, if you want to, to identify a villain in the story of Mozart's Requiem, is this chap here. But he's not really a villain, because without Count Franz von Walsegg, we wouldn't have the Requiem. Now, Count von Walsegg was, was a bit of a sneaky chap. He had a habit of commissioning works from composers, paying them handsomely, and then passing them off 
as his own. He had his own orchestra, he had his own choir, uh, and so he would, you know, the, the, who's going to believe this young composer, particularly if he's written his name, and I wrote this on the front of it. Um, and so his plan was to honour his, uh, his young wife who had just died, uh, Count von Walsegg commissioned Mozart to write this Requiem. And because he wanted it quickly, he offered him a substantial sum. I mean, far more, perhaps, than he would have offered uh, if there wasn't a, a, sort of a, a time pressure on it. Now, um, it had to be anonymous. That was one of the aspects that, that Mozart had to agree to. It shouldn't have Mozart's name written on it. It was an anonymous commission and had to be uh, provided anonymously. Um, and Mozart effectively turned him down and it was the the huge amount of money that convinced him because obviously with all these pressures on his career on on his time and on his his financial situation he had to take the money although he was already very weak very overworked uh, and had lots of other projects to finish including the magic flute um you know that he couldn't say no to the money so interesting mozart worked incredibly hard throughout uh, the, the latter part of 1791 getting iller and iller and as we know he didn't actually complete the entire Requiem score and in a few moments we'll be looking at some extracts uh, of the fragments that Mozart wrote um, but interestingly we do know I think for the most part that, that the, the Requiem was completed by a number of his students the most famous of which is this chap at the bottom here uh, which is uh, Mr Sussmeyer and he is one of Mozart's pupils. He was chosen for a number of reasons. First of all, he really understood Mozart's style, although he didn't have Mozart's flair um, for composition. He was a bit more of a workmanlike, safe pair of hands, effectively. Um, and it turns out Sussmeyer was at Mozart's bedside on the night of his death. Now, the day before his death, on the 4th of December, 1791, there was actually a performance of of as much of the Requiem as Mozart had finished. And we see a representation of that in this work here. Mozart was joined uh, in his room by three singers and Mozart himself played the viola, to which was his instrument, of course, to, uh, to, to support the singers. And they played through as much of the Requiem as had been completed up until that point. Um, and he'd written a substantial part of it. He hadn't yet written the Sanctus, the Benedictus, or the Arnus Dei, and of course the Lux Eterna and, and Cum Sanctus and so on hadn't been finished, but the assumption was that that would just be a repeat of the first movement musically. Now, uh, there, is, there are all sorts of legends about this last performance. There is a particular legend that they got to the eighth bar of Lacrimosa, Homo Reus, which is as far as Mozart had written in that movement, and Mozart burst into tears, convinced those were the last words he would ever set to music, and it probably is the case that they were um, whether that's true or not we don't know that's uh, that's a legend um, but we do know that he was too ill to continue with the performance he didn't go on and play the subsequent mo movements he did uh, leave sketches um, quite a lot of sketches actually um, for Hostias and uh, and Cuomo Le Marbrehe and so on that, that followed um, but he called Zeusmeyer in and they sat and Mozart told him how he wanted the Requiem to be completed. So this is why Sussmeyer is most associated uh, with the completion of the Requiem, but there were others who worked on it, in particular his other student, Herr Ebler, uh, and we'll see in a minute where his contributions came in. He was one of the people who was responsible for filling in the parts uh, from Mozart's notes. Now, tragically, at midnight on the 5th of December 1791, Mozart died. Um, and he was buried the following day in a mass grave in St. Mark's Cemetery in Vienna with 16 other bodies. And this is this is sort of over the years come to suggest that Mozart died in abject poverty and was buried in a pauper's grave. Um, but actually, uh, you know, this was the common uh, the common way. The plague was was very very prevalent. Space was at a premium. Uh, Mozart was not a member of the nobility. He was. You know, a commoner, relatively speaking, and this was fairly common for everyone to be buried in a mass grave. I see from the notes people saying, I didn't know the viola was Mozart's instrument, always thought it was the piano. Of course, he played the piano beautifully. His 
his preferred string instrument was the viola, as was Haydn's instrument. It meant they could sit in the middle of the orchestra and direct everyone else. That's not to say he couldn't play the violin as well, but the viola was seen within the string section as the lead instrument. Interesting how things change. OK, so let's uh, let's crack on now. Of course, um, after Mozart's death, we all know that this lady here, Constanza, his wife, uh, took possession of all of her husband's affairs, including the sketches for the Requiem. Uh, she asked two of Mozart's former students, the aforementioned Franz Xavier Zussmeier and Joseph Abler, who, I've, uh, who I mentioned a moment ago, to complete the score. And we can see, I don't even quite make this out, but this is the uh, the opening of the Dia Zire, And at the top here, the, the top parts that are written in for brass and so on, these have all been completed by Herr Abler. Uh, now, Count Walsig, who commissioned the work, was unaware of the change and accepted this work uh, as... Uh, having been completed by Mozart. This seems to have been very deliberate on the part of Constanza. She in no way would have wanted him to suspect that she'd gotten Mozart's students to finish what Valsek had paid handsomely for. Um, but she did insist that his name was on it. So, you know, the cat was out of the bag. Valsek couldn't pass it off as his own. Um, and as I already said, uh, Siusmeyer's uh, completion of the Requiem was largely pedestrian. It's not to say it's not unmusical. There are certainly some very pleasing moments in both the Sanctus and the Benedictus. The Arnie today also has its charms, um, but you can definitely tell there's a, there's a drop in, if not in quality, certainly in complexity and, uh, uh, and inspiration, I think, as we move from Mozart's material into the, mo into the movements that are completed by his, uh, by his master. And so we know that Constanza lived a lot, uh, a lot longer than Mozart, uh, and died, you know, moderately uh, well off. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the the line of composers very much died uh, with Wolfgang. So, when it comes to Mozart's Requiem, having having talked about this, and we'll listen to just a few moments of the piece in a moment. Um, what is fascinating is that everything is calculated within the Requiem so that it represents death itself. You have elements of um, you know uh, of mourning a sort of that that pathetic element and also you have elements of terror in the confutatis and the diazire you have joy uh, uh, you know uh, and moments of elation you have moments of calm but for the most part it doesn't have the same bright verve that his masses have for example and a lot of that's down to the instrumentation there's no parts for flutes um, there's n there's no oboes in it either. This is written for bassoons and basset horns, which themselves are an, uh, an ancestor of the clarinet and actually slightly darker sounding. Um, you also have the use of trombones, which prior to this weren't used particularly in the orchestra. Beethoven obviously started to use them. They became a mainstay of the orchestra in the Romantic era. But at this point, they are church instruments, having come up through the Italian school, through Vivaldi and uh, Monteverdi and so on. And so the idea of using trombones in any situation is to give a sense of foreboding, I think. Uh, and so sad and solemn, really, this particular orchestra is perfect for the Requiem Mass. Uh, and Mozart's writing is, is really quite sombre. Uh, almost austere. There's there's no sparkling solos. If you consider that the, the Queen of the Night's aria and Papageno's song from the Magic Flute, which are bright and exciting and jump around all over the place, are examples of what he was writing just weeks before he wrote the Requiem. This is relatively staid and, as I say, quite sober. Uh, now, it's not to say there aren't moments of, of spectacle. Uh, the Dia Zeri, as already, already mentioned, is just pure uh, fire and brimstone uh, and confutatis, you know, it's, it's, it's like an incredible storm hitting and everything trembles in angst and fever and impatience. And really, the, Mozart's last composition is just sublime. It, it's, even though he didn't finish it, the reason it's so beautiful and so, so loved is because he poured his heart and soul into it, as I've said, almost like a final confession. So what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to listen to a few elements of this. And what I have for you is a very special treat. I've linked to the full performance in today's description. And I'm just going to get the details up so I can tell you about them. Um, but this is a particularly... Oh, what actually happened to that? I say I've linked to it, but I clearly didn't save it. I shall make sure that it ends up in the description following this. But it is a, a performance of the fragments of Mozart's Requiem. So only the bits 
that Mozart wrote. And this was recorded uh, in 2016. It's a wonderful, wonderful performance. It's very, very moving, as you'll hear. So let's listen to the opening. And remember, Mozart only completed the orchestration of the opening two movements. So it's, that's Requiem Eternum, Grant Them Eternal Rest, and Kyrie Eleison, Lord Have Mercy. Let's listen to a little bit of the opening for this. I'm just going to change headphones so I can listen along. And if you want to conduct along at home, I certainly will. It's just absolutely sublime. Here we go. And these mournful instruments. So just that opening here, we can hear these overlapping instruments, the mournful long lines. As I say, none of the contrapuntal, the intricate writing of his operatic works. This is really Mozart confronting death, this, this friend of mankind, as we've mentioned. Um, and as we scroll through quickly, I just want to find the opening of the Dies Irae. Now, before I do, bearing in mind, when you watch this uh, full performance, the first two movements are fully uh, orchestrated, but as we go through, you'll see parts start to drop out, and that's because Mozart didn't actually write these notes in. They were written in by his students, by Zusma and by Ebler. So let's have a bit of Dia Zire. Here we go. <laughs> to let that cadence land so we can see already st we're starting to work from a skeleton score those of you who are followers of my deep dives and my round sound will notice at the bottom here on the score the organ part has figured bass and this was a, a technique that was a, hand, a holdover from the baroque where you'd have a bass line but you'd have numbers written underneath to indicate the chords that would be played over that bass note a uh, very particularly complicated technique for for people to learn but once you learn it it's like shorthand you can fill in the chords and as we go you'll hear more of that figured bass coming through in this fragmented performance now the uh, performances with the two bar mirum the solos here are even more sparse this is a solo movement and we don't have time to play all this today let's have the start of the rex tremende okay uh, tremendous king and just listen to how this is different from uh from mozart's or from from the zusma completed original where you have the the trombones coming in on the beat listen to this <laughs> Just the end of the two-bar mirror.
So this is stuff that Mozart had left for us, and his students have subsequently come along and filled in the gaps. As we scroll through, you can see the uh, the sketches for the excuse me for the record diary are mostly complete. But as the singers come in, the instruction really was for the instruments to be colla parte, to follow the vocal parts, to be with the parts. And so it's rather sparse, just some of the instrumental parts filled in. Now we come to the last two movements, or I say the last two movements that Mozart worked on. It's not to say the last ones from the Requiem, but the Confutatis, have a listen to this. It's just the bass and the voices. It's really quite something. It's up the last few moments, excuse me, of the Recordare. Here we go. So here's Confutatis, this fire and brimstone. in the middle feels wrong without a koala singing it um so just going to skip on folks as we just have a moment or two bear with me just want to play you the lacrimosa now bear in mind that he did leave other movements uh the, the hostias uh, uh and and um domina jesu christi he did leave the sketches for that but this is where his pen left the page so let's just have the opening here of the lacrimosa and it is so powerful to think these are the last notes that mozart wrote here we are that's it i know it's so so moving to think of that as being the end but actually he left us a little more than that there was a fragment of an amen which was supposed to come at the end of the lacrimosa now of course uh famously susma finished with a simple plagal cadence but have a listen to this this is a bit of an amen which never made it this is left on the cutting room floor have a listen <laughs> And that, to me, this is this is one of the great tragedies, is that we, we have two uh, incomplete movements, and Susma felt, I think, confident to finish the Lacrimosa, but not confident enough to finish the Amen because it's so fugal. Uh, people have tried to reproduce it, including H.C. Robbins Landon, who did a version of this, which I sang. He didn't do a particularly good job. Um, so it's, it is great, you know, truly one of the great tragedies that we don't know what Mozart would have written if he'd had... Uh, the chance to finish it, but we have enough to be aware that it was one of the great, great choral works of its time, and in fact, of all time. So, everyone, thank you for your time today. I hope you've enjoyed our first deep dive in a while. If you enjoyed it, well, we'll be back next week. We're going to have a special one next week. For those of you on the SIC uh, Russian week, uh, we won't... Well, first, we won't be doing a Classics and Trad next Wednesday because it's summer school week next week and there's just such a lot on. But we will have a deep dive at 2 o'clock next week on 
uh, Rachmaninoff's All Night Vigil, commonly known as The Vespers. So come along at two o'clock next week. It's a half hour show and we'll be talking an, in a little bit more depth about this great work, about this great composer. And it's a bit of background for those of you who are on the SIC uh, Summer School. And for those of you who aren't, well, you're going to enjoy it anyway. So we'll see you for that. Uh, otherwise, we'll be back on Friday for Fun Friday. Uh, lots to look forward to. We're back at 1 p.m. on Friday just for this week. So please don't come along at 2 because uh, you'll have missed it. All right, everyone. So all the very best and do enjoy your day. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>